Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. Today is Tuesday, June 7th, 2022. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. I'm really excited about tonight's broadcast because we're, I'm going to be talking about Evoke's, uh, Evoke's clinical vision. And, and part of the choice of the words vision is to communicate a, a, a kind of a sensibility, a way of thinking, a way of being that permeates our Evoke programming. Recently, I've been asked about our, our by some some folks who have uh, clients or, or or aren't a part of our program at Evoke. They have a, might have a child or be a client of another program, and they they asked about the the possibility of joining us live, being part of the live broadcast. And we've we've explained to them that that's reserved for Evoke families, Evoke current and alumni families of both of our programs. Um, and and part of what they've said, you know, is that that some other programs use the podcast. In fact, some programs actually use old webinars from 2000, from the early 2010s. And, and so my team was saying, what, what, what should we do about that? And, and, and you know, how do we respond to those? So, so in the course of giving my explanation, I, I was explaining to them a couple of things. Number one, the vision has changed over the years for sure. So uh, like I've said other times, I say this to parents, to children, if you're the same person in 10 years from now, if you have the same thoughts, ideas, um, if you have the same conceptual grasp of, of life, of relationships, you, you've wasted, in a sense, 10 years because we're always growing. We're always learning new things. Another piece of it that I've explained is it's not just the podcasts or, or the, the live webinars even or the webinars that you can see on a YouTube channel. But really what we're talking about is a culture of a program. And it might seem like from, from, from a distance or maybe if you're new to this work, I mean, I have a lot of compassion for, for people that are new to this work because you're, you're not going to recognize the difference between the evoke approach or the evoke vision and other visions. I was talking to a professional recently and, and I was saying a lot of programs, in fact, virtually all programs do parent work, have a, a parent, uh, a significant parent programming, although I believe that, that evokes is unrivaled in, in its robustness and its, in its breadth and depth. Um, but it's not just that we do parent work, but there's a different kind of work that we do here, a different way of thinking about children, about families, about parents, about people. And so that's really what I wanted to share with you this evening on this broadcast is that sensibility. I'm going to start off with an old image of a model that I think is, for those of you who are watching live and can see the screen, um, or if you're watching on our YouTube channel, you can see the screen. Um, it comes from an old idea from the journey of the rogue parent, so that's five or six years old. But I think it really encapsulates uh, the, the simple message about the way we think about mental health, mental illness, and, and healing, especially those areas that we have control over. Somebody just asked me this week through social media when I was posting about the, the, the effect of a parent on a child and then the, the child's nervous system and development. And they said, but it wasn't just that. I mean, my, my adopted child has some genetics that, that I had no choice over. It came with some learning differences and the what, what they encountered in the classroom and with peers definitely had an impact on them. And all of that is true. And my response back is you're absolutely right, that, that it's not a, a kind of a nature versus nurture or one variable or another. It's a combination of things. Part of mental health and part of mental health education is holding on to complexities, holding on to, to even paradox and, and dialectical ideas, ideas that have that seem at least on the surface to be counterintuitive or that seem to be in, in conflict with each other, being, being able to hold two of those ideas, those desperate ideas at the same time. But going back to this model, I, I think this is a, about as simple as it gets when we think about the, the task of therapy and the task of helping people to heal. I call it the cycle of health and wellness. It was given to me in, in a, on a piece of paper with no references many years ago, and I've, I've updated it since. And it was called the wellness cycle back in, in, when I began my career. And it's a basic model that says this. You know, we're born and we come into this world. And every human being has, every person alive has desired experiences, things they gravitate toward, joy, happiness, feelings of connection and love, right? Those are natural impulses or drives in all of us. Um, and there are also, of course, people when they're, when they're living, going through this life, they encounter um, undesired emotional experiences. Uh, they encounter divorce, the death of a, of a loved one, sexual abuse, rejection, bullying, 
the list is not comprehensive, of course. And, and out of those undesired uh, experiences come undesired emotions. And that becomes the moment, the moment that's important. And that's why parenting in, in proximity and close proximity to your children is so important over the long run because it, it's, it's not just... It's not just the traumas that they encounter. That's real and, and need to be needs to be processed. But what I want to explain to you, and this is a this is a big idea, and it might be hard if you're hearing it for the first time, but it's it's how the family deals with that emotion and teaches the child through every bit of communication, through, through every bit of, of how they respond in, in the relationship to the child. It's how the child is taught and, and, and how the fa family models dealing with pain, trauma, sadness, and hurt. One of my critiques of some of the trauma-based uh, information that's out there is they talk about traumas pretty clearly. They talk about that people are pretty aware now that, that there's a direct link between trauma and, and self-medicating behaviors like substance use disorder. I think people are becoming very clear about that. But what they don't talk about and don't explain is what I would call developmental trauma. It might even be called small t trauma. It, it's how we, it's how we relate to the problem. It's how we relate to pain. It's how we relate to loss. It's how we relate to sadness, to, to frustration, to difficulties, to failure, and and how we communicate that relationship, kind of teach our children to do it themselves. I was writing something for social media today to kind of illustrate this point. And the question that I posed and, and, and answered was, how do we cheat, teach children about right from wrong? How do we teach children uh, uh, how, to, how to have empathy for other people? And my answer was, you, you teach them how to feel. And when they learn how to feel, they recognize feelings in other human beings. And, and they're sensitive and responsive to those feelings, to the hurt. And, and they, they treat other people like they're, they're, uh, they're a human being that deserves compassion. So, so my wife, when she was looking at the quote, she said, but what do you mean about teaching someone how to feel? And it's listening. It's regulating yourself first so that you can deal with your child's dysregulation. It's having a, a firm sense of yourself and healing your own trauma, your own family background, unraveling that so you can be present with your child when they suffer the, the, the innumerable amount of setbacks that a human being s suffers in life from, you know, failing a, on a test or struggling to, for an audition or, or not passing an interview and getting the job. How we think and respond to those. Think about all of those examples I just gave of, of traumas. It's the exact same experience that every parent can relate to when you're watching your child when they're a toddler or, or, or a, a grade schooler and they trip and fall, and they look at you, if you're present, they will look at you to see the reaction that you have before they'll decide how they're going to react. Every parent who, who's watched a child play for any length of time knows what that feels like. So that's how they learn. So if they can talk about it, if it's a safe context to metabolize it, to feel it, if they don't get gaslit, dismissed see see because of our empathic sensitivity because because we feel so much sometimes and we don't we didn't have a, a healthy model of, of boundaries and what it meant to be a self sometimes we re we respond to our child's pain with with terror with with with, with fight or flight and, and we try to talk we think the goal is to help our kids to feel happy when really the goal is to help our kids feel everything. And I can't emphasize that idea enough. So if the family models and teaches and makes space for the child to talk about it and feel, the child learns to integrate. The child becomes a whole person. They, they get through it. They, they move through feelings. If they're not allowed to feel because the parent is too anxious, too eager to, to stop suffering and, and discomfort in the child because they have, uh, uh, like I said, not quite un, un, uh, unraveled and healed their, 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 and done their own work. If they don't know 
what their relationship is with pain and with anger and with undesired emotions, they might have reactions that tell the child to repress it, to, to ignore it, to make it go away. Then that child will develop symptoms from the unexpressed emotions. This is a big quote I'm going to share with you this evening. Um, it's from Sigmund Freud in 1909. And he, he wrote, in analysis, uh, a, thing that would, a thing that has not been understood inevitably reappears. Like an unlaid ghost, it cannot rest until the mystery has been solved and the spell broken. And Freud was an amazing writer and is in, understood by, by most therapists in the world. But he knew that if you didn't, if you couldn't tell the story, if you couldn't talk about it, and that's kind of how human beings feel. It's possible to feel without talking, of course, but, but talking is often a vehicle on which this, this process rides or, or moves. If you're, if you're not able to feel and you don't know how to feel or you repress feeling, you develop symptoms. And those symptoms are substance use, school refusal, stealing, you know, addiction to screens, fighting, self-injury, the list goes on and on. So the work in therapy is sitting and asking people how they feel. I remember working with, in the very beginning of my career, in fact, that's how I met my therapist. She was a supervisor and trainer. That, that was hired by the company to come in. I work with sex offenders, men who had been convicted of some sexual offense, anywhere from you know, sexually abusing a child to sexual assault and everything in between, all the, the whole gamut around sexual abuse and assault. And, you know, when I went in there, I said, I, I kind of need some tools. I need to know what to say and do. I was, I was, I was overwhelmed with the prospect. And essentially my supervisor just said, just ask them how they feel. They'll talk about their day. They'll talk about being cut off at the, you know, on the way to the grocery store and what that made them feel like. And when you allow them to go through feeling that, that, that ability is like a muscle. It will extend to all the other, other feelings that haven't been felt. And when all the feelings haven't been felt come to the surface and get felt, and it has to come at the right time when the person is ready and capable of feeling them, you, 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 in essence, are healing the wound. So the way to get rid of symptoms, and I can't think of anything more, um, more, more alarming than sexual assault and sexual abuse as a symptom. That's kind of the, the pinnacle of what one human can do to another in terms of its symptomology, its pathology. The, the secret is not stopping the behavior. And I think that's, what Evoke knows, it's finding out what the behavior is telling us, what, what unexpressed need or dilemma has been unresolved. And that is the vision, folks. And that's not just the vision for, vision for children in our wilderness program. That's the vision for parents of children in, in our wilderness program. And every family and every couple and every individual that comes to our intensive program, we, 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 we get to be witnesses. We get the honor. That's really what a therapist, I believe, gets is they get the honor to sit and bear witness to somebody's story. And when somebody starts to feel and is allowed to feel, tell the story, they then can move through it. If they don't move through it and they're not allowed to feel, that feeling will remain fixated and become toxic. It, it can become so toxic that it can cause physical symptomology. It can cause tumors and cancer and headaches and ulcers. I mean, it's not hard to imagine that. Everybody understands that you can you can take your, your, your emotional distress and store it in the body. It affects the heart. It affects our immune system. Right? I wrote this. I wrote, children act out when they can't or when they don't know how to get their needs met. And we are all children. Another part of our vision is, yes, we will... We accept the charge in our wilderness program of, of helping children that are struggling. They're clearly in need of support and, and some kind of um, containment, right? They need to be protected from themselves for, for the time being until they can get healthier and evolve a little bit. But, but aside from that, that initial agreement, what we do is we say to the family, we're going to treat with the same compassion, the same non-judgment, the same support that we're going to treat your child. And, and we're not going to educate you and have you go to podcasts and webinars and read books. 
we're not going to do all of that because we think you simply caused all the problems and you're the you're the start of everything. It's because everybody in the family is suffering from the same disorder, which is the disorder of not feeling, not being their authentic self because they haven't learned it. And so tonight, part of the vision is, uh, is we talk about accountability at Evoke a lot and awareness, but without shame. I've had therapists that have that we've hired over the years, and they they they've come with a with a different model. It's more about it's more about authority. It's more about behavior and outcomes and controlling and fixing symptoms. And as I've shared with them, our model, which isn't again, it's not an evoke model that we created. We we've added our flavor to it, but it comes from the masters. It comes from the 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 work and research and attachment theory, and also the. The, the work and the research of Joseph Campbell, the, the great uh, scholar that, that talked about how mythology teaches us about the human dilemma. And as I've explained this to them, I've, I've tried to say, we are teaching and talking and doing something just a little bit different. The first letter, probably the simplest example, the first letter the parents write to, to a, a, a student, their child, at Evoke, we call it the, the hopes and intentions letter. This is my hope and my intention for sending you. Whereas, by and large, many programs, most programs still use what's called the impact letter, which, which to, to, to be transparent, we used for many years. Because I, I, you know, it, was, it was handed to me when I first started as a wellness therapy, therapist, and we kept doing it until I thought, it, it's not about, it used to be called the impact letter, it's not about how the child's mental health issues impact the family. And that's what those letters by and large became and, and, and were over the years. But it's really about what's underneath the symptoms, what's underneath the mental health issue. Again, what I love about psychology and psychotherapy is I think it offers a, a, an intelligent, a, a, a complex, a flexible and evolving, but most importantly, a compassionate model toward people that are suffering. But it's so hard for humans to do that. We love to feel our anger and our rage and our frustration and not just each other and our families when, when, when somebody's acting out, but we love to feel it about strangers and people that do horrible things in the world because the theory is that anger and, and that rage and that judgment protects us from feeling the authentic grief and sadness and, and lost and hurt. So like I talk about where, where I brought this, this graphic for, for, from, for those of you that, are, that can see the image on the screen, where I brought this from, and if you can't see it on the screen, just go to my, my Instagram page and, and it's, it's there. Um, what we're really doing is we're teaching people how to feel. That's what I used to tell my young children when I first got the job of being a therapist and they were five and three and growing up. I would say, daddy's teaching people how to feel. He's teaching the sad boys, I used to say, because I worked with boys back then. He's teaching the sad boys how to feel. And, and, and I know that it's more complex. I know that there are genetic and organic um, and, and, and medication can play into it and learning disabilities. There's a whole lot of other things. It's more complex than that. But, but just to get a grasp of it, that's the simple vision, the simple model that we at Evoke talk about. The second thing I want to teach you about is we are an experiential therapy program. In our wilderness program, it's primitive living. You know, everything is on carried on their backpack. Nomadic living, which means we don't go back to a base camp and every week. We don't get in vehicles and go into adventure every week. We don't do those things. Um, at our intensive program, it, it's art therapy. It's, it's, it's psychodrama, which is kind of role-playing type of therapy. So we use experimental, experiential methods for, for our therapy. That's one way that we are experiential, but we're also experiential in another way. That first way, I wrote this. I'm kind of proud of the fact that that woman uh, in the bottom picture is my ex-wife, the mother of my, my two older children. I'm, I'm glad to see her face on this, glad to have her in, as part of the family. I wrote participation in rituals or exercises or, or metaphors, especially when they're not contrived, like if it just happens in the moment. Um, they have the ability. See, that's what metaphor, parables, analogies, 
can do for people. They have the ability to bypass the fences and, and find access to, to trauma that is stored in the nonverbal parts of the brain, the unconscious parts of the brain, so to speak. Um, and so we can find access to trauma when you're in a role play talking to somebody who's playing the role of your mother and you're playing your teenage self and, and, and your mother is your, you know, the, the 1980 version of herself, just wearing a name tag that says mom, that's what we do in psychodrama. And you go back and you talk to her, you'd be surprised what comes up for people. So, so metaphor and experiential activities, um, including the whole body help bypass or go around the defense and find access to trauma and healing in ways that talk therapy cannot and does not. However, this is what I think virtually all programs miss. The experiential part of therapy, while those methods are fantastic and we'll continue to use them, and they're very, very provocative and dynamic and powerful, and that will, uh, I'm sure, always be true, the experience of sitting with a therapist, even in a room with fluorescent lighting and no windows, right? Trying to make, make the images as plain as possible. And just talking about your life and about your feelings, about your dilemmas. The experience of, of taking that risk and, and, and telling your story to the therapist. And the risk is that they'll respond like your parents, like my parents like my parents' parents, like my great-grandparents, like most people. Jamie Gill wrote it this way. The experience, she wrote, of seeing one's base from a different perspective can be profound. One way this happens is by allowing ourselves to be honest and open with someone who does not react the way our parents did or our teachers or, or the others from our childhood. For example, she writes, what was very bad at home is now nothing. The difference in experience allows for the realizations that things could be different. One's assigned position in one's past is not necessarily one's assigned position in the universe. I read a quote from Demi Lovato this week. Demi Lovato, some of you might know, was recently admitted herself to, to, to treatment for, for addictions and, and self-harm and depression and some other things. I don't know all the details. But the quote that I read from her said that the first challenge in my recovery was, was me believing, uh, coming to believe that I was worthy of recovery. And what she's saying is she made so many mistakes. She lied to so many people. I'm sure I don't know the details, but I'm sure like a lot of people that are self-medicating, she hurt a lot of people. And because of that, she ha had learned from her context that she wasn't worthy of love and healing and recovery. And so that's what Dr. Gill's talking about. That's what we're talking about. That's the difference. The difference is that at Evoke, we have a compassionate lens. Yes, I mean, that's what the story of the Knight in Rusty Armor is about. That's the book that we ask all of our students to read, the one book that we ask all of our students to read that I would recommend to all of you, and I've done podcasts on it. If you come to an intensive, we will send it to you because it's it's the motif that we use the night when, when he was trying to get off his armor, which was a metaphor for his defenses. He first went to the blacksmith and he stepped on the blacksmith on accident. He stepped on the, because he's wearing a visor and he can't see and he's clumsy. He stepped on the blast, blacksmith's foot and, and hurt the blacksmith. Then he stepped on when he went to the castle to look for the king. He stepped on the court jester, Gladbach's foot. And then when he met the king along his path, whom he loved greatly, he stepped on his foot. And, and the king said very clearly, uh, after the, the, the knight was falling over himself, apologizing, the king said wisely, your arm is hurting you more than it's hurting me. Jamie Gill said in the sequel that she wrote to the Nine Rusty Armor, she says, what we do to protect ourselves hurts other people. And that's just the truth. That's just what it is. And the people that need the most compassion, you know this because you've experienced it. The people that need the most compassion in life are oftentimes the ones that, that are the hardest to be compassionate towards because they've hurt you or others that you care about or respect or value. 
So yes, we are experiential because the activities that we do, and that's what people think of classically when they think of experientially, but going to a therapist, going to a 12 step group, walking into a parent support group is itself, I believe the most important aspect of the experiential. That's why when I therapist, when I tell them this, when a client confronts you, when a client is angry with you, it's best that you respect it and listen to it. Don't make excuses. Don't turn it around on them. When it's appropriate, be accountable, apologize, and try to do better the next time. Teach them, show them how it's done. Show them what it looks like when an adult is in the room and somebody's hurt or angry. We are an attachment-based or an attachment-informed model. That means that we understand the way that children, human beings, are built you know, brick by brick. That's the idea. That's the study of it. So we're not looking at a, a, a sliver or a slice of a human being. We understand that things like EMDR and brain spotting and cognitive behavioral therapy and lots of things out there are good at kind of tools to use to help people. But attachment, in, in fact, realistically, there's no such thing as attachment-based therapy. It's a made-up term in, in, in a manner of speaking. Attachment theory is a theory about how human beings develop in relationship to their parents and how the parent-child dynamic informs and shapes the child to, to, to who they become. But attachment theory doesn't tell you what to do in psychotherapy. That's where the masters come in. That's where the Freudians come in and the Jungians come in and the analysts and the psychodynamics come in. Because what they understand is the therapist for the moment kind of takes place as a stand-in for the parent and tries to create an experience that's reparative. Just like I just, that quote I read to you. When a, when a client comes in and, and confesses some horrible sin, quote unquote, my response is, yeah, people do that sometimes when they're scared or when they're hurt. I get it. And while that, that response might frighten you, because it feels like uh, that, that it might be giving permission or, or it might be uh, implicitly in, in endorsing or allowing the behavior, it, it has, doesn't have that effect. In fact, the reaction that is driven from the place of changing the child or the parent or the person, of getting them to improve their behavior, that's the problem in the first place. That's not the solution. That's the poison. That's not the cure. That's the poison. So you, you, to, to be a capable parent or partner or friend or therapist means you have to manage and take responsibility for your own self-regulation, first and foremost. Tomorrow I'm going to post, I, I wrote a post today that I'm going to share tomorrow on my social media. And I was explaining, because I hear people talk often about their 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 religious or, or, or spiritual hero, heroes and say, you know, I, I want to be like the Buddha. I want to respond with non-judgment and compassion so my, my family members feel safe. And I say, that's a wonderful uh, bar to, 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 to look toward, to strive for. But remember this, the Buddha, the monk, the wise person always retreats to, to a practice of prayer, and or meditation and or quiet reflection as often as they need so that they can be there for the people that they love. That's what the work is about. You have a child that's struggling with self-harm and depression. We support you in, in a sense so you can support them. We give you a place to talk and complain. I, I, I've had people, I've told you this before, people complain about the 12-step the groups, and they say, well, that's just a place people go to complain about their lives. And my response is, absolutely. That's the best place to go. Don't do it to your children. Do it to your friends. Do it to your sponsor. Do it to your mentor. Get it off your chest so that when you show up to your partner, the child, the friend, the, the, the employee, whoever it might be, you're there for them because you've been taken care of. We know that, that, that 
the parents understanding of themselves is a key ingredient in their ability to provide attachment. And that's why we ask you to do your work. Simple. There's a direct relationship between a parent's understanding of their own early childhood experiences and their ability to show up for the child in the way that the child needs period. And the research is exhaustive. All the attachment researchers will tell you this. We learn in, with attachment informed therapy that, that relationships with others is how we experience, and make sense of ourselves. So if I have a therapist that's frustrated with a parent, we process through that. And I say, you're frustrated, you're frustrated with a parent who's showing up, not, not in a way that you want in a way that you think might not be helpful for the child. But I need to remind you, I, I explained to the, the, the therapist that parent is a hurt and injured child, child too, in need of healing and compassion. And yes, I know they might not be making the decision that you think is the right one, but that's not your job to get them to make the right decisions. You know, when people come into me contemplating a divorce or contemplating where to send their, their child next, we can have discussions about it and, and we do, but, but I, but I explain to them, it's the same work getting divorced or staying married. It's the same work. Sending your child away to, to a program or not, it's the same work. It's the work of knowing yourself, of understanding and un unraveling what you're made of, the messages. So much of therapy is unlearning. Even the very name evoke is, is intentional in the way that I'm describing it tonight. Evoke is, uh, the, the name evoke means that we don't impose our values and our truth on to the client, but we simply create an experience where the client can discover themselves. Of course, de-emphasizing behaviors, performance and outcomes leads to better outcomes. I, I just ordered a, ordered again, cause I, I give it away every time I get it. I read a book called art and fear and I've talked about it a couple of times in the last handful of uh, a, a broadcast. So I'm not going to retell the same story, but it talks about this relationship that when folks are afraid, they grip it, they grip it tightly. That's, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the fear, the anxiety, the, the, the nervous system upregulation that you feel when your child is struggling. How do you manage that so you can show up for the child and their needs? Because if your job is to, to, to lower your nervous system response and the child needs to get better to do it, the child becomes, doesn't even get considered in part of the equation. Like I talked about, parent support and involvement, it's not just that we do it and that we do a lot of it, it's that it's a different kind. Even the idea that these broadcasts, which started off as just webinar broadcasts that got years later turned into to, to podcasts and now the podcast version of it is our biggest listening audience. Even all of that is very important because it's a safe way. You can listen to this and nobody in the world will know. You can listen to it while you walk in your office, while you drive somewhere and nobody knows. And if something starts to strike you, if you start to hear something new, different, maybe you'll walk into that 12 step meeting, or maybe you'll, you'll try out psychotherapy for yourself. Cause that's the hope. We're all just bumbling through this life, doing the best that we can. And we think we need to have all the answers. And with, with that idea, what we're really doomed. The, the, the goal here at Evoke is to be human and to teach other people how to be a human. And that's what our parents support and involvement is about. And if you have a child struggling with mental health, doing what you do already might not be enough. It might not be enough spiritual and emotional support for you to be able to be there for them. If your child is, is struggling with addiction, you might need a support group on a regular basis to help you deal with that pain and that sadness and that loss. If you have a child that's self-harming or a child that's refusing to go to school because of anxiety or, or learning differences, you might need more than just the typical amount of support. And we know that everything that we offer is probably too much for everybody, but we're trying to find any way that we can to reach you books, parent portal, 
the new program, the, the intensive program was was born out of this. The podcast, the webinars, the YouTube page, and so forth. I just want to make sure that, that I'm not frozen on your screen, Malia. I'm frozen on my screen, but I hope it's all it all looks good on your end. Okay, good. A compassion. I mean, it's a requirement in our program that that clients, families, loved ones, um, that we deal with them compassionately. Because punishment doesn't work. If it did, we wouldn't, Evoke wouldn't need to exist if punishment worked. But again, in, in some really important ways, punishment, not only is it not the solution, but it's the problem. This, this kind of autocratic uh, power, uh, power over somebody, controlling, forcing kind of uh, sensibility that for a lot of people is the problem. Ultimately, at Evoke, what we're talking about is the word that I use and borrowing it from Joseph Campbell and some others is, is transformation. That this work is transformative and that what we're really doing is, is helping parents to begin to build a foundation so that they become more capable of responding flexibly, of reacting to, to each other, to their children in ways that, that are helpful for the child's mental health. And by the way, if it's helping you to help the child, it's also helping you because it's the same work. When you know, when you know what you need, when you, when you sort out, have a much better understanding of yourself, then you know what other people need. It's the same thing. Compassion. You know, I, I know I've gotten some criticism from this in the past. Um, sometimes I quote people that aren't perfect. In fact, I would probably argue that without much, without really, a, I don't think there's a good argument against it, that everybody I quote is imperfect because everybody's imperfect, some more than others. But in, in the journey of the rogue parent, after Columbine, there was a news report that, that the two young men that had committed the atrocity, that they, um, that they were fans of the, 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 the rock singer, the shock rocker, Marilyn Manson. And um, when, when Marilyn was asked by a reporter, he was asked, what would you say to the boys? He, he was told that the boys listened to your music and looked up to you. What would you say to the boys if, if you could, could talk to them, if you could have talked to them before all of this happened? And Marilyn said, I wouldn't have said anything to them. I would have listened. And, 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 and I don't think it's a leap for me to say, I think Marilyn suffers with a lot of mental health issues. And he knows what's needed. And he's not all fixed, for sure. I'm going to share some quotes that I've, some slogans that we have. I think that communicates what we do. One of the ones that I like a lot is sometimes you can't win, you can only choose how to lose. This idea that you don't get to win, you get to choose how to lose has changed my life. Because so many folks, parents, partners included, come to me with a dilemma asking a question about what they what they can or should do in a certain situation. Even when they know, I'm not going to tell them what to do. I'm not going to tell them what they should do. And they always say to me, I know you're not going to tell me what I should do, but what should I do? And after listening to, to them and listening to the pros and the cons of the, uh, of the decision that they have to make, the boundary they have to set, whatever it might be, I, I, I'm reminded that I, I tell them, I think you have an unwinnable situation. If you choose, you know, what's behind door number one, there were certain there are certain privileges and, and, and rewards that come with that, but there are also costs. And if you choose door number two, same thing. There are different rewards and there are different costs. And we can talk about what each of those are, but I can't tell you what to do. It's like trying to talk uh, somebody who, who's gay into telling the world about it. You know, tell your partner, tell your family, tell everybody. While that might seem like a woke or enlightened thing to do, it is, uh, it is in its own subtle way a, a, a cruelty because you don't know the cost and they're going to have to pay it. They could lose their family. They could lose all the connections they know. They could be kicked out of their church. They could be fired from their job for all you know. Their, their children could reject them. So when we think we know what someone should do, 
we don't really understand we don't really understand what it means to have a healthy attachment because that's not the job the job the expertise if you will in 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 the theory of attachment is that the parent or the authority figure or the therapist doesn't have answers for the child or for the client but they know what kind of environment to establish so the person can find their own answer so remember you can't win oftentimes you can't win you can only choose how to lose and you do get to choose how to lose this is something i learned from my al-anon friends if it's historical it's if it's hysterical excuse me if it's hysterical it's historical all that is is saying if you have a reaction to a situation a conversation a, a relationship or a person that seems or has been somebody even yourself or somebody else has accused you of having a, a bigger reaction than the than the present situation before you um suggest that you that you might have wonder become curious if it's touching on something historical you know when pe people say this to me all the time i'm sure you've said it i've said it you know people will say to me about marriage they'll say I, we got into a dumb fight my, my spouse and i got into a dumb fight and i say well probably on the surface it was pretty stupid because i've been in those many times and we'll get in more of those but if we can peel back some layers it's not stupid at all but that's that that requires vulnerability that re requires setting down the defense and you or i or the client or the child might be too afraid to do that in the moment i even had a therapist i've had many therapists overvalue vulnerability i talk about this all the time i've i myself have overvalued vulnerability i used to talk about trusting the process not a lot but a little i thought there was no harm in the phrase trust the process but here's the harm in the in the phrase trust the process is what if you have a lot of experience as a person that trusting and being vulnerable has not worked for you that you've been hurt that people have been cruel to you when you've been vulnerable and for me just to tell you to trust the process and that vulnerability is a good thing is to in a way collude with that that old behavior and to re-abuse you so instead of saying you should be vulnerable i would rather have a conversation about tell me why it's scary tell me what you expect tell me what you're worried might happen where did this happen to you before does it remind you of something if it's hysterical it's historical from the from the audacity to be you this is directly from that book in this way of thinking the evoke clinical vision in this way of thinking you don't get to be right or good anymore but you do get to be a self which is so much better a very simple way to understand recovery from codependency which is really just a, a popular psychological term for um an attachment wound having most often uh, an anxious attachment style um that the best simplest way that i can describe it is that folks that are in re in their recovery from codependency or from from anxious attachment wounding if they're in recovery from it um they don't try to prove to the world that they're right or good or that they have the answers they say things like this is just me see that's the problem with with what what the boundary work out there is about it's not about figuring out the right boundary it's figuring out your boundary just like you get to decide i use the example of food i don't like mushrooms you get to decide if you don't like mushrooms or tomatoes there's no right way you get to decide if you like cats better than dogs you get to do that in your life that's the privilege of being who you are this also came from the 12-step folks this next one my serenity is my responsibility again it's not if you're a parent of one of our our clients it's not just about you because everything i'm talking about happened to you too in one way or another and so when people get very hung up and say well you're blaming, blaming everything on the parent i say well if that's the way you see it then let me just point out if i'm blaming the parent then i'm blaming the grandparent then i'm blaming the great-grandparent and the great-great-grandparent and, and on infinitum so nobody really gets blamed there's no shame in it 
everybody gets dented and bruised in this life. Everybody gets hurt. Nobody's perfect. But here's the rub with this particular slogan. If my serenity, Brad Reedy's serenity, is dependent or reliant on my children being healthy and good and safe, I am placing the burden of my life on them. Now, to be clear, I love my children as much as I am capable of loving somebody. Whatever that is, as much as I'm capable of loving, that's how much I love those four children, those four people. And my life and my serenity is my responsibility. Because on top of whatever they're struggling, they don't need to worry about them hurting me. And, and I will tell you that most, I don't know if it's most, yeah, it's most, it's by far most. Most therapists that I've met in my lifetime don't teach that. They teach that it's just a natural thing for a parent to be worried about a child. And while I will agree with you, it's natural. If you love somebody and they're suffering, you're going to suffer too, to some extent. You have to go take care of that yourself. Remember, the program that has been set up and established on earth to help loved ones who, who uh, uh, to help people who have loved ones that are suffering significant addiction and, and self-harm, alcoholism and, and gambling and, and sex, addiction, all of those things. This comes from them. You go in there and, and you kind of hope secretly that they're going to give you a couple of silver bullets to use to fix your alcoholic son or your, your addicted daughter or your depressed spouse or your anxious spouse. You kind of hope that that's going to happen. And what they say is this is not about them. We're going to focus on your disease, which is that you need somebody else to be happy for you to be okay or be well so you can be okay or be safe so you can be okay. And that becomes a burden to them on top of what else they're dealing with. I wrote this, I already talked about this one, contemplating a divorce or a breakup. Know that the work is the same either way. That's, you know, that people come to intensives for those reasons and for those questions. And what I say is, look, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't possibly, it's not even in, in the realm of, of, my world that I could know what you should do. And that goes for how many hours of screen time your child should have to, should you let them go to, to prom? If there's going to be alcohol, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the decision is, I don't know that what you should do, but I know the work is the same, no matter what. <clears throat> I've told this story, but I think it bears repeating in this context. When somebody challenged me, when I was teaching about codependency at, at a workshop, and a psychologist challenged me and said, how could you suggest that we, that we encourage or coach parents to kick their children out of the house, their adult children out of the house, those children that are addicted to drugs when the child could die? And I said, I would never tell a parent to kick a child out. I would help a parent heal their codependency and they would decide. And I can imagine any number of healthy decisions that might look on the surface to be in opposition to each other, but they come from a healthy place. I wrote these three keys to enlightenment and they're, they're, they're the last chapter of the audacity to be you. I think about them now and again, because this is kind of like way down the line. As I sat and thought about writing the conclusion of my last book, I thought, what is it? You know, what are the spiritual practices? that are involved in, in, as therapy progresses, you know, what, what does it look like? And I came up with these three keys. Key number one, learn to be okay with being wrong and get really good at losing. Because when you can be wrong or, or lose, first of all, you're modeling being human because you're going to be wrong. And so is your child, you're modeling accountability, which is the best way to teach your child, not to make them accountable and, you know, back them into a corner or hold their feet to the fire. That can feel very threatening. But to be accountable yourself. To own up to your mistakes. Key number two, come to know your darkness and remain on speaking terms with your mental illness. I'm going to say something to you and, and, and 
I don't know if it'll sound crazy or or off, but uh, I found it to be true. The problem is that people don't know how damaged they are because there's shame about being damaged. And I will tell you, I, Dr. Brad Reedy, am damaged. I have wounds that are not healed. I have behaviors that are maladaptive. And I enact those on the people that I love at times. I'm working on all of it. But in, until I until I die, they're, they're gonna be there's gonna be something there. That's why the wise ones, they don't talk about how they're healed or how they've arrived. They talk about the wisest people talk about their fallibility. So that's what that's talking about. Key number three, learn how to die again and again. Old context believes in relationships. It's about learning and evolving. The old self dying so that the new self, the more authentic version of the self, can be present. It's having new ideas. It's realizing that a relationship that might have been really important and supportive you, uh, to you in a, in a time of need now might not serve you anymore. And it might be best for you to, to, to walk away from that relationship. I'm not talking about divorce. I'm talking about a friend, a mentor, a teacher, a friend. It could be anybody. Lastly, I, I talk about the shame cycle because, because, like I've said before, when people talk about how do you, how do you deal with or, or or talk about or treat shame in therapy, my response, having learned this from others, was that's really all therapists are doing. Is trying to figure out how to help a, a person look at themselves without shame. You know, at, at Evoke, we talk about. I said this from the beginning. The, 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 the vision is accountability and awareness without shame. So years ago, in fact, I was waiting to, to meet with my therapist. I'd arrived a few minutes early to her session, and I was just contemplating and thinking about how children that, that came to the program, back then they were reading impact letters. This is even before, this is even before um, uh, Evoke, before we started our own program. They would read that letter from parents describing the things that they had done that, that, that led the parents to the decision to send them to the program to treatment. And they would cry and they would hide their face and snot would be coming down and they'd be genuinely feeling regret and guilt and shame and remorse. And then a day later or two days later, in essence, they'd be demonstrating the same behaviors the, that they were just the day before feeling totally ashamed of. So I wanted to understand, because I knew they weren't lying. Parents always ask, is my kid lying? And I'm like, they're not lying, but that's not the solution. Shame isn't the answer. I wrote not too long ago that, that what we think is the, the, the cure is often the poison. What we think is the solution is actually the problem. Most people think shame and guilt. Some who have some education understand that shame is really, really harmful. But most people... Almost everybody thinks that guilt is, is a healthy thing. But guilt causes just as much hiding and denial and repression and, and stops as much growth as shame. So I came up with this model. I drew it on a napkin. And, and, and I also looked into myself. And I saw my own pattern of, of people pleasing and then feeling shame for, for, for my feelings and my acting out and then people pleasing. I looked at myself too and I came up with this in eight steps. The first step is that the person has to have a sensitivity, an empathy. They have to be able to read other people, to, 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 to perceive what other people want and need from them. And then, as children, they, they give that to the person, to the parent. They focus on meeting the other person's needs. The child learns that taking care of others results in, in positive attention. But their needs are being subjugated, are being repressed are being dismissed and not attended to, repressed. And so then they take care of themselves through maladaptive ways. Maybe it's food, maybe it's alcohol. The list goes on and on. So they're getting their needs met, but not overtly. Because what is being paid attention to, what is being rewarded is when they take care of other people, when they're a good kid. And then there's some experience in all of this that the child experiences this pattern that I've described is 
it being forced and controlled and conscious. And it's almost never conscious, almost never. So the child feels controlled and then the resentment builds, anger builds, maladaptive behavior increases because of that agitation. There's a well of unresolved, unfelt, undealt with feelings. And eventually it can lead to a blow up and a complete rejection of what the parents, the family, and the dominant culture believe. Everything that the parents believe is right and wrong. If, if the parent is a teacher, the child drops out of high school. If the parent is a police officer, the child gets arrested. If the parent is a therapist, the child develops symptoms and doesn't want to talk to a therapist about it, right? So it can reach that peak. And then, of course, there's often a, a, a moment of guilt after the rage, after the acting out. The person feels humiliated and ashamed again. And then the pattern repeats itself. And so the way out is we have to. I wish I, I, wish I could get this message out into the world and, and teach it in its complexities. We have to get we have to do battle with shame, but we have to do battle with guilt. If you're not bumping up against guilt and learning to push through guilt to do the right things, like my daughter said at a, at a conference, I quoted her. She said, breaking free, this is my daughter, breaking free of my family's dysfunction causes me a great deal of guilt. And so I go to therapy so my therapist can help me carry the guilt. If you're not doing battle with guilt, I, 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 I find it hard to imagine that, that you're progressing in the work overall. So in, in conclusion, we do use psychodrama and group therapy at the, at the intensives. We use wilderness therapy in our wilderness program. But the more fundamental experience is understanding how the therapist feels and thinks, how the parent feels and thinks, how the staff feel and think about the child or the parent or the adult is the most important ingredient in the healing process. What we talk about at Evoke is based on attachment, right? Which is a theory that doesn't tell you how to do therapy, but a theory that tells you how human beings develop. Psychodynamic is, is the therapists who understand the psych psychologists, the analysts, the psychoanalysts who come in and, and provide this kind of healing reparative experience that I've been describing all night. Child development, of course, like I said, Joseph Campbell, and then I wrote, and anything else that helps. See, the model, if the model is too big, I've met therapists who, who look at their models like it's a religion. You've got to be flexible. Attachment theory doesn't tell you what to do. So the good news is you can do a lot of things. You can do EMDR. Sometimes you can raise your voice. That's not a go-to. That's not a one trick pony, but sometimes you can, and it works because the person knows you care. They know it's from love, not from fear and ego. So that's why there's no generic technique or solution. There's no generic approach. It's a way of seeing people, a way of seeing yourself, a way of being in the world. We know that the work is yours and we know the work is your child's and we work on both. We know it's about transformation and not about symptom reduction and skill building. We know that when we don't focus on outcomes and control and behaviors and symptoms, that we have better outcomes. We know that when we go to the source of the issue, instead of treating the symptom, that we're addressing it at its roots. If you, if you go out and take a mower to the weeds out in your front yard, you know as well as I do, they'll grow back up. And if you pull them up and you haven't gotten all the roots, they're going to come up somewhere else in the garden. We know that the use of rich, the metaphor and ritual are, are, are important. We know that so much of why you're here, why you're listening in this work is because there are unconscious drives at play. If this was all about consciousness, about what you know and can see, anybody could do it. People would just read manuals about psychology and, and you could just go and sit in a class and learn. But it's not about that. There has to be room. There has to be some allowance for the unconscious, undealt with, unexplored parts of ourselves that are, are the ones that are the parts of us that are really driving things. All of it, you know, we use ritual and we use rites, rites of passage. We think that, that, that evoke all evoke programming is not a detour. It's not a sidetrack from life. It's part of the journey of becoming who you are, which is the goal of therapy, to become who you are. I read a quote from a, a philosopher yesterday that said that, that all the geniuses 
are the ones that are best at being who they are, being themselves. And then, of course, that, that we we can talk about accountability and awareness without shame and guilt. I know I'm I'm at time, so I'm just gonna we we can I'll, I'll go over the 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 questions that, that are might be left over when I meet with you on Thursday, but I'm just gonna go through everything. My two books, The Journey of the Rogue Parent and The Audacity to Be You, are available on Amazon and Audible. If you want to give back, our three charitable partners are Choose Mental Health, ChooseMentalHealth.org, or Sky'sTheLimitFund.org, or EvokeFamilyFoundation.org. If you want to do a deep dive in your own work, June, uh, actually June 22nd, um, I think we might be full. Just contact intensives at EvokeTherapy.com. We have new intensives each month. June 22nd is the next one, July 14th after that. We also offer them online June 24th. Less money, less time away, if that's a need. We have a young adult one that's just starting this Friday. I think that's that's full and, and locked up. There might be a spot. I'm not sure. And then we're going to do a returning to you. I'm going to run a returning to you in the fall. So if you've been to a Finding You and you want to come back and do more of it, October 12th through 16th is the date for that. Intensives at evoketherapy.com or go to our website. We have Evoke coaches, attachment-based coaches, trained coaches, uh, parent coach, life coach, Marital coach, um, stage of life coach that can help. Just contact coaching at evoketherapy.com. We have pursuit trips that are adventure trips for families or adults. Think therapy light, sober fun. And they're customized trips anywhere in the world, anytime from 3 to 30. It could be an in-between program or maybe at the conclusion of a program. It could be a nice way to support and augment the therapy. Contact Sarah at evoketherapy.com for more information. We ask all current and, and alumni families to go to any combination of, of of these 12 step support groups six times six six times alanon.org coda.org familiesanonymous.org adultchildren.org also refuge recovery.org and nami.org uh, have local chapters in most areas that can provide support and education free of cost all of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app or spotify just search finding you and evoke therapy podcast or go to soundcloud.com or also go to our youtube channel and you can watch and look at the slides there if that's something you want to add. Uh, you can follow Evoke Therapy Programs or me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on Twitter and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy or at Dr. Brad Reedy. Also, Evoke Intensives has an Instagram account, at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching either Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensive, Intensives. Uh, and we have a wonderful blog page that is that is curated and supported by Malia Boyd, who is our moderator for these. And she does a great job of having our therapists and our staff write wonderful, insightful, creative blogs each week. So click on that that page and, and, and get new, new content each week. My next broadcast will be two days from now. So June 9th at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. I'll take any questions left over. Um, you can have family and friends or siblings come. If you feel like it's appropriate, feel free to share the link with them. They're welcome to attend live if you're an Evoke family or an alumni. All right, folks. I hope this was helpful. Point of contact. I know it was a lot. And, and as I always like to end, thank you for and on behalf of the people that love you. Thank you for showing up and being willing to do your work because it makes a difference in, in, in how you show up for the people. So for and on behalf of them, thank you for being willing to do your work. Have a great evening. I'll talk to you in about 48 hours. Bye-bye.